The documentary hypothesis is a highly convoluted and extremely outdated theory maintained for one reason only, to discredit the Bible. It survives only because it ignores evidence. It ignores an abundance of archaeological evidence, and it ignores the internal testimony of the Bible. The documentary hypothesis is a lie Moses wrote and compiled the Torah. Prior to modern archaeology, the Bible was believed by Christians to be the oldest document that the world had in existence with the five books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch or Torah or Law, uh, claiming to be compiled in the 15th century BC. However, at the time, there was no known archaeological records that showed that writing was even available in the 15th century BC, and the oldest inscriptions dated to the 10th century BC, a 500-year gap. So critical Bible scholars theorized the Pentateuch couldn't be written at the time of Moses, but was in fact compiled and edited by a menagerie of authors that relied on oral traditions and stories that had been passed down through the years until it was finally put to paper around the time of King Solomon or even later, some believed, at the time of King Josiah or some even after the Babylonian exile. These theories were pushed by German and French theologians in the 18th and 19th centuries, such as Jean Ostruck, Johann Eckhorn, Karl Heinrich Graf, and later Julius Wellhausen. They argued that there were at least four different authors or groups of authors who contributed to the formation of the Torah, the Jehovanists, the Aluists, the Priestly Sources, and the Deuteronomist, also known as the JEPD theory. They noted significant evidence that the Torah was not the product of a single author, Moses, and in fact the Pentateuch had been highly edited by the time the Hebrew scriptures were canonized by Ezra. There are also quite a few doublets in the Pentateuch, especially in Genesis where stories are repeated several times. Also, there are multiple events recorded in the Pentateuch which clearly take place after the death of Moses. Also, there are multiple names used to describe God, such as Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai. Uh, there were place names of different locations that didn't match the time period of Moses. And so because of these inconsistencies, the proponents of the documentary hypothesis, or DH, felt that there was ample evidence that the Torah had been written at least a thousand years after many of these events had taken place and after the life of Moses, and that there was little to no historical accuracy to the first five books of the Bible. Notice what Julius Wellhausen states in his book, The Promulgia to the History of Israel. We cannot gain any historical knowledge of the patriarchs, but only about the time when the narratives were written in Israel. The period with all of its deep and superficial characteristics have been unconsciously projected back where it's reflected as a transfigured ghost. Basically, we can't know anything really about the times and the customs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the Bible, only about the customs of the people when the books were written a thousand years later. Uh, which only makes sense, I mean, if you, if you believe the Pentateuch was written 500 to 1,000 years after these events took place, and your only source for composition relied on oral traditions and campfire stories passed down through the ages, because you believe the Hebrews were illiterate until they were taught to read by the Phoenicians in around 1,000 BC, it only makes sense that there would be little to no historical accuracy to the Torah. Could you imagine trying to write a book about the life and times of historical figures from a thousand years ago, having no records to go on because you just learned to read and write? Try reading the Canterbury Tales in the original Middle English and tell me how plausible it would be to recreate it today. Well, that's what Jewish Wellhausen, the proponents of DH, teach, that the works of Moses are highly inaccurate, has little to no historical value, it's probable that none of the characters mentioned ever existed, and the ones that did resemble very little from what is recorded. In short, the writings of Moses are a big fraud, and if Jesus Christ, who attributes the Pentateuch to Moses, states clearly he gave us the law, refers to the stories of Abraham as historical events, if all this is a fraud, then clearly Christ is not divine, and that's the main goal of DH, is to argue that Christianity is founded on a joke and a fraud. However, despite the fact there's a percentage of the evidence that the proponents of DH present that is actually true, the conclusions they draw from this evidence is highly outdated and highly dishonest.
Many deceptive tactics are at play here to try and fool someone to believing that DH is the product of unbiased scholarly research, when in fact it's nothing more than an elaborate attempt for atheists to try and discredit the Bible. Of the information that is presented by DH that's actually current, much of it had already been acknowledged and explained by traditional historians and Christian theologians thousands of years ago. Their discoveries that the Bible had been updated or edited had never been hidden. It's always been acknowledged, and it's never been a problem. Secondarily, a wealth of new archaeological data has been found since Julius Fellhausen published his History of Israel in 1878, and the professors who still teach DH are deliberately ignoring and suppressing all of the archaeological data in order to push atheism in our colleges. Uh, thirdly, alternate theories, uh, including traditional Christian explanations that don't push the idea that the Pentateuch is a fraud, are never considered or mentioned. The only data that is repeated is that which promotes their theory. See, up until the time Julius Wellhausen, it was the belief of critical Bible scholars and historians that writing was unknown to civilization until the time the Phoenicians, who developed it at around the first millennium BC. However, as cuneiform tablets began to be unearthed in Mesopotamia and in the middle and late 19th centuries, proponents of DH had to at least concede that although writing might have been available at the time of Moses, it definitely was not at the time of the patriarchs. German theologian Heinrich Ewald states, The accounts of the patriarchal time contain no sure traces of the use of writing in that early age. Hermann Schultz wrote in Old Testament theology, Of the legendary character of the pre-Mosaic narratives, of the time which they treat, is sufficient proof. It was a time prior to all knowledge of writing. Well, they were absolutely wrong. Not only was cuneiform writing available during the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was extremely prevalent and found everywhere in the Near East as far back as 3300 BC, over a thousand years before the time of Abraham. It was a very cheap and common way of communication that was used by all classes of society. Frederick Dietschitz, a Syrianologist, wrote of how commonly and informally cuneiform was used. We find amongst the letters which have survived in great abundance a woman to her husband of his travels telling him that the little ones are well and she asks his advice on a trivial matter, or the missive of his son to his father in which he informs him that so-and-so has morally offended him and that he should thrash the knave but asks his father's advice first. Or another letter in which a son urges his father to send the last of the long-promised money. This writing was used very commonly. D.D. D. Duckenbill's Ancient Records of Assyrian Babylon speaks of how common cuneiform writing was as well. This writing material was cheap, which may account for the part that the fact that the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians seemed unwilling to transact even the smallest items of business without recourse to a written document. Cuneiform tablets were so common and cheap to produce, they even found a clay tablet receipt for a single bag of beans. One bag of beans. So, you know the tablet had to be much easier to come by than the receipt, or somebody's getting ripped off here. See, the clay in Euphrates Valley is abundant, extremely fine, similar to well-ground flour. When mixed with a little water, it was formed into a tablet. A stylus was made of wood or bone and sometimes metal with a triangular-shaped end that was pressed into the clay, making a wedge-shaped impressions. These impressions were made in parallel lines representing different words. The tablet was then baked in the sun or at times in a special kiln. Uh, sometimes a little chalk or gypsum was mixed into the clay to keep it from cracking. Once dried, these tablets are the most durable forms of writing next to stone. However, it's important to understand that cuneiform is not a language but a writing system. There's Assyrian, Hittite, Sumerian, Babylonian, Persian, numerous other languages have been found to use this writing system. It is believed that there are upwards to a million cuneiform tablets discovered so far waiting to be translated. So it's quite absurd to believe that such an abundant 
common and widespread form of writing that every other society in the Near East had and used for almost every situation, including a receipt for a bag of beans. But those Hebrews, those guys, they chose to be illiterate for another 2,000 years. Well, uh, not only is this absurd, it's patently false. Two cuneiform tablets were found in Mesopotamia in modern Iraq that dated to the time of Abraham and were translated to be found written in Canaanite, a precursor to Hebrew. It is most likely the exact same language the patriarchs all spoke. Archaeologist Brian Wood states about these tablets that the language in the tablets is that of a Northwest Semitic language nearly identical to Biblical Hebrew. These tablets show conclusively that at the time of the patriarchs, the inhabitants of Canaan, of which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, they live right down the road from all the other Canaanites, they could, just like every other civilization on the planet, use cuneiform. And if they had something important to write, like their entire family genealogies, they could just write it down like everybody else and all their neighbors. They didn't have to rely on oral tradition or campfire stories. Professor Yorgi Kohan of the Tel Aviv University Archaeology Department states, The text proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that already in the second millennium BC, there was a spoken language that was very close to Hebrew. But more importantly, it shows the Canaanite language, of which Hebrew is a very close dialect, was being written down using the cuneiform system of writing at the time of the patriarchs. The Hebrews were not illiterate. Okay. Also recently, a phenomenal discovery was made in 2019 by Dr. Scott Stripling on Mount Ebal in northern Palestine, where he discovered a lead curse tablet that dated to the 14th century, early 15th century BC, written in Paleo Hebrew and mentions the name Yahweh, the God of Israel. This once again shows that no civilization in the Near East, especially the Hebrews, were illiterate. And then you have the Amarna letters. In 1884, a treasure trove of over 380 cuneiform tablets were found at the one-time Egyptian capital of Amarna. Once translated, it was determined that these tablets dated to the 14th century BC and were the correspondence of different heads of state to the pharaoh, including a few from Babylon, Assyria, Hittite leaders, and all in the Akkadian language. However, by far the majority of these letters, like over 300 of them, were written from Canaanite leaders to the pharaoh in Akkadian, including 58 letters which were desperate pleas of help from the invading Hebrew, no doubt the Hebrews led by Joshua in the conquest of Canaan. Once again, you see no evidence that anyone in the Fertile Crescent was illiterate during this time period. Anyone who tells you otherwise is straight up lying to you. And the book of Genesis shows this clearly. Not only is there a lot of cuneiform syntax in the Genesis account, but there is a high level of accuracy to the stories that can't be preserved through oral transmission. See, if I'm going to try and preserve a story through reciting folklore and legend, no matter how many times I tell the story to my kids, I threaten to beat them if they screw it up when they tell it back to me, some of the story is going to get lost, you know, after a thousand years. I might be able to preserve the, you know, the general gist of the story or get some of the names right, but many of the specific names, customs, phrases, idioms, little nuances, it's going to get lost, you know, because they have no meaning to someone a thousand years later. And what we're going to see is that there are dozens and dozens of these nuances, idioms, phrases, historical notes in Genesis that if you look up in any Jewish commentary, they have no idea what they mean because they weren't the customs of the Israelites in the 5th, 10th, or even 14th century BC. It wasn't until our modern archaeology of our age where these cuneiform tablets, which had been lost to antiquity, were deciphered and they, we began to understand the customs and the historical backdrop of the 2nd millennium BC in Mesopotamia. John Bright, in his book History of Israel, states the following regarding the biblical account of Abraham and the patriarchs. When the traditions are examined in light of the archaeological evidence, the first assertion is to be made that the stories of the patriarchs fit unquestionably and authentically in the middle of the second millennium BC and not in any later period. Renowned archaeologist William Fox Albright confirms this with the following. 
The narratives of Genesis dealing with Abram now may be integrated into the life and the history of the time in such surprisingly consistent ways there can be little doubt about their substantial historiocracy. S.H. Hook in Archaeology and the Old Testament states, It is safe to say that the general effect of the discoveries of the last decade has been to confirm their substantial accuracy of the picture of the life in Canaan in the second millennium B.C. And I could go on and on with a dozen more quotes, but unlike Bible minimalists, critical scholars, and woke journalists who simply point to the other experts that agree with them, we're actually going to go through many of these examples and show the historical accuracy of the Genesis account and how these customs match perfectly with the customs of the Fertile Crescent in the second millennium BC and not of any later Israelite customs of the 5th, 10th, or even 14th century BC. But as we go through these examples, I'm going to focus mainly on the patriarchal period. I'll admit that any one of these examples probably aren't conclusive of and by themselves. It's plausible one or two of them could be coincidental or possibly transmitted accurately through stories told over the campfire after a thousand years. It's possible. But as we go through many of these examples, example after example, and we see that some of them are very obscure and easy to overlook, if you're honest with yourself, you're going to see there is no way these details could have been preserved with such a high level of accuracy without detailed records. And if you say, well, they must have had records. Well, if they had records, why couldn't those records have been, you know, the actual original Torah? For instance, in Genesis 37, it mentions that Joseph and his brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Archaeological evidence has shown that that was the correct price for a slave in the 19th century BC in the Near East. Later in Deuteronomy 22:19 and Leviticus 27:3, almost 400 years later, it states that 50 shekels was the going rate for a slave, which is correct for the 15th century BC. It would be very hard for someone writing, you know, a thousand years later, after the fact, to get these little details right if they didn't have detailed records. The Fertile Crescent, also known as the Cradle of Civilization, stretched from the Persian Gulf all the way down to Egypt and the Red Sea. And during the time of the Patriarchs, the trading caravans were at their pinnacle with Haran meaning caravan city. If you look at a Bible map and see the travels of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Eleazar, Abraham's servant, and how they traveled freely throughout Mesopotamia, Transjordan, and to Egypt. Ur of the Chaldea was the largest of these trading cities, and the travels of the patriarchs closely matched the exact same routes and cities that were frequented during that time period and no other time period. We read in Genesis 37 of caravan traders like the Ishmaelites were moving from Shechem to Egypt how the Hittites had a trading post in what is now Hebron. There are several other references to independent city states and smaller regions that existed in Genesis, such as listed in chapter 14 and chapter 20. Well, that was a very unique time in history due to the fact that there was no dominant empire that controlled the region, and there weren't numerous territorial warring empires that prohibited this type of travel. Genesis 14 mentions separate kings of Sumeria and Elam. Yet by the time we come to the story of Exodus, all of this had changed. By the 16th century, the Egyptians had controlled Transjordan and put most of Canaan under their tribute. By the late 1750s, Hammurabi of Babylon expanded his territory and dominated the trade routes in his region. He conquered Sumeria and Elam, and they were no longer independent. At around 1600 BC and onward, Assyria also dominated its region. Each ethnic group had carved up for themselves a piece of the Near East and tried to protect it. Once again, the patriarchal narrative showing the freedom of travel and lack of large empire fits the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries and not any later time period. Many of the caravan routes and cities of them were only available during this time period and not of any later time period. For instance, in Genesis 24, it refers to the city of Nahor. Well, Nahor ceased to exist after the 13th century. In Genesis 20, we learn that Abraham had moved to the city of Gerar, where Sarah was taken by King Abimelech. Although the region of Gerar continued to be occupied and still is to this day, 
archaeological digs at the city of Gerar have shown that the city was no longer inhabited after the 18th century, right after uh, Abraham was there. Once again, showing that these stories fit the time of the patriarchs and not any other time period. One of the most distinguished Assyriologists of his time, A.L. Oppenheim, states, There seems to have been very few periods in the history of the region when a private person could move around so freely. And that's exactly what we see in the Genesis account. If we read Genesis 14, we learn of two alliances of city-states who were competing for dominance that led to the people of Sodom being taken captive in Lot. Once again, the existence of independent city-states working together and joining in these power alliances was characteristic of the 19th and 20th centuries and not existent after the time of Exodus. A cuneiform tablet referred to as the Mari letter states, There is no king strongest by himself. Ten or fifteen kings follow Hammurabi of Babylon, and then lists a number of other kings that follow uh, Yamin of Yamhad. Not only that, but there were two tablets uh, Yachandam S and Yachandam W, which are very similar to the Genesis account in chapter 14. One verse shows that Shalamander, king of Elam, was the lead city in this alliance. From cuneiform records, we learn that Elam was in fact involved in these kind of political military ventures during the time period of 2000 to 1700 BC. Once again, these events were only possible at the time of the patriarchs and not any later period. Also at this time, the pharaoh of Egypt during the 12th and 13th dynasties had an east delta resident on the edge of the caravan routes. In all other times, the pharaoh kept his residence in Memphis, Amarna, Luxor, much further inland for obvious strategic reasons. But during this time period, and only this time period, the pharaohs had their residence at Rawadi from the 16th to 20th centuries BC. The pharaohs during this time period were known to have attraction and, and to take foreign ladies on the edge of these caravan routes. This easily fits the story of Genesis 12, where Abraham on his caravan route at the edge of the Egyptian territory, where foreigners were allowed to come in, we find the pharaoh at this location. He quickly finds out about Sarah because he had scouts that were looking for foreign ladies, and he takes Sarah because of her beauty. All of these scenarios easily fit in this time period and no other time period. Another interesting find is the ratio between donkeys and camels listed in Genesis. During the 19th and earlier centuries, uh, donkeys were the preferred pack animal as better breeds of camels hadn't been developed until the 15th century. And we see that in Genesis. Excluding the story of Rebekah in Genesis 24, donkeys are mentioned 15 times while camels are only mentioned 6 times. This reinforces the prevalence of donkeys as the preferred pack animal during this time period and not any later periods. Also, many of the personal names of Bible characters were common in Babylon and had been found in tablets such as Abram, Jacob, Laban, Zebulun, Benjamin, these names fit the region and the time period of the patriarchs. Beginning in Genesis 12, God had promised to make Abraham a great nation, but Abraham and Sarah at the time had no son, and Sarah was barren. We all know the story. Notice Genesis 15, verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me since I go childless, and the heir of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, you have given no seed to me, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. Well, you might think this is a bit odd. Why would Eleazar of Damascus be his heir? Why wouldn't Lot be his heir? He lived right down the road. He's his nearest kinman. Why was Eleazar referred to as one born in my house? Well, once again, cuneiform tablets unearthed in Nuzi, they showed that this was a common custom and a law in many regions of Mesopotamia that without a biological son, the firstborn servant would now be the next in line as heir. This is completely different from Israelite inheritance laws where property always stayed within the tribe and in the family. In Israelite law, if there was no biological son, your property would now be given to a near kinsman. In the law of Moses, there was no scenario where a foreigner could inherit tribal land. We see a stark difference between the inheritance laws of Mesopotamia from the laws of Israel and once again with the story of Jacob and Laban. As we know, Laban tricked Jacob into marrying Leah instead of Rachel and his excuse is given in Genesis 29. 
Verse 26, it states, It must not be done this way in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Well, once again, as cuneiform tablets were dug up in Nuzi and Arkfada outside Nineveh, they show that Laban was not really being honest again. See, it wasn't necessary that Laban had to marry his oldest daughter off first. It was that without a son, his inheritance would go to his firstborn servant, like in the story of Abraham. Unless, unless his eldest daughter was married and had children, then his estate would go uh, to his son-in-law, uh, his eldest daughter, and eventually to his grandson. That's why he wanted Lee to get married so he could keep the estate in his family, and Jacob was the perfect fit. Many years later, we learned that Laban did end up having sons, and in Genesis 31, verse 14, it says, Rachel and Leah answered him and said, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? The only way they would think they would ever get an inheritance is because there was a time when Laban had no sons and it would be given to them through Jacob. And then after he had sons, they received no portion of her inheritance. Once again, this was a custom and law of ancient Mesopotamia and not Israel. There was no scenario in the laws of Israel where a daughter would receive the inheritance of a father. These little fine details would be impossible to preserve through oral tradition. Another example of Mesopotamian inheritance laws in Genesis is in chapter 16. Sarah has been unable to have children and decides to give her handmaid to Abraham so they can have an heir. Genesis chapter 16 verse 2. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has kept me from bearing. I pray you, go into my maidservant. It may be that I may be able to obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the words of Sarai. Notice she didn't say so that you, Abraham, can have a son. No, she said so that she, Sarah, can have children by her, Hagar. Mesopotamian inheritance and adoption laws allowed a barren woman to obtain a surrogate to bear a child for the wife for inheritance reasons. According to Richard Page, Old Testament archaeology professor at Ambassador College, in ancient Mesopotamia during the second millennium BC, surrogate mothers would give birth with the adoptive mother kneeling behind them during delivery. This was a legal procedure showing that the child would now be legally adopted. We see this legal procedure mentioned again in Genesis 30 verse 3. In here, Rachel is upset because she can't have children, and so she gives Jacob her handmaid, Bila, so that she can have children by her. Once again, like Sarah, she is to have the child, not necessarily Jacob. Verse 3, it states, And she said, Behold, my handmaid, Bila, go into her, and she shall bear upon my knees, and yea, that I may also have children by her. This reference of her bearing a child upon my knees had no meaning to the Jews in the 15th, 10th, or 5th century BC in Israel. This was a custom that was unknown until the 20th century archaeology where we discovered that it was a custom in Mesopotamia in the 2nd millennium BC and no other time period. It is ridiculous to believe that these little clues and nuances could have been preserved by telling campfire stories over and over, you know, after a thousand years, especially when they had no meaning to the Jews. These details would only be preserved through written documents, of which we know every civilization in the Near East knew cuneiform, including the Semitic people. The books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles have always been attributed to Ezra the priest, and the etymology of the Hebrew and Aramaic fits the 5th century BC. Very few scholars can test this. However, the book itself covers a period of over 500 years and gives a chronology from King David to Cyrus the Great. However, Ezra did not rely on campfire stories or legends told at the local tavern to write down the two books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles. He lists nine documents he used to compile chronicles, including uh, Samuel, Kings, the book of Nathan the prophet, the book of Gad the seer, the prophecy of Ajiah the Shilonite, the book of Shemani the prophet, the book of Jehu the son of Haniah, the sayings of Hosea. Well, as we're going to see, Moses did the exact same thing. He had at least 11 cuneiform documents he used to compile Genesis, with a 12th document probably written in Egyptian Heratic. And like Ezra, he lists his sources. 
each cuneiform tablet ends with the phrase, these are the generations of, or this is the book of the generations. Or as the NIV version states, this is the account of Adam or Noah or whoever it is. One very common habit for songwriters, authors, journalists, speechwriters, I do the same thing myself, we typically decide on a title at the very end. After all's been written, then the title's selected. Well, with cuneiform, due to the fact that a scribe had a very limited time to write, once the clay had the correct amount of moisture, depending on air temperature, you had a limited amount of time to write and then bake this tablet or it was going to crack and crumble. You can't just go back to the first page, you know, a few days after the fact and edit it after it's been baked. So it was quite common if there was any corrections, notes, uh, making an acknowledgement, adding a title. This was all placed at the end of the last tablet referred to as a colophon. In these tablets, you can see each row of writing, and then towards the bottom, there's a single or double line representing the end of the document. Beneath this line is the colophon, where scribes would often place the title or make mention of the author or add any notes. And that's what we see in the book of Genesis. There are 11 of these documents listed with the colophon always at the end, many of which were compiled from multiple tablets the book of the origins or histories or the account of the heavens and the earth, the book of the origins of Adam, the origins of Noah, the origins or the account of or the histories of the sons of Noah, the origins of Shem, the origins of Terah, the origins of Isaac, the origins of Jacob. Each tablet ends with this phrase or colophon, the origins or the generations, or as the NIV states, the account of the author. And we're going to see that 11 cuneiform tablets all ended with this phrase, and then it lists the author or authors of that tablet. This word translated generations in the King James is the Hebrew word toledah, which according to Brown's Drivers Briggs means proceedings or generations or genealogies, an account of men. Strong's defined as history. Notice what Dr. S.R. Driver states. The narratives of Genesis is cast into a framework or scheme marked by the reoccurring formula, these are the generations, literally the begettings or genealogical histories of. The entire narrative we now possess is accommodated to it. Professor H.E. Ryle states, referring to the phrase, that it represents, as it were, successive stages in the progressive of the narrative of Genesis. And multiple other Bible commentators, such as Spurgeon, Lenormat, Skinner, Carpenter, Keel, Bullinger, Langlings, uh, Wright, all acknowledge this framework in the composition of Genesis. There is a belief that the title or the first book of the Bible, Genesis, comes from the Hebrew word reshith, meaning beginning, as in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that's incorrect. Uh, the word Genesis is a Greek word. It was given to the first book of the Bible by the translators of the Septuagint. And it is a translation of this Hebrew word toledah, meaning the origins or generations. If you look in your Septuagint translation in Genesis 11 verse 10 or in any of these colophons, the Greek here states these are the Genesis of Shem. The title Genesis is derived from this word toledah, which is used in every colophon. This shows that the Jewish translators of the Septuagint understood the connection of these phrases to the composition of the entire book. P.J. Wiseman in his book Ancient Records and the Structure of Genesis shows some very conclusive patterns that shows that Genesis was built on these cuneiform documents around this colophon. In every single section, when you examine the content of it, there is no instant when the author or authors could not have been intimately aware of the events that are described in it. They either lived during the time period when those events could have taken place, or had been an eyewitness to those events, or could have talked to someone who was an eyewitness to those events. And this is true in every single section of Genesis. Secondly, in none of these documents does the attributed author record his own death, which makes sense, but is mentioned in the next set of documents. Also, when we look at the transitions between documents, in almost every situation, we see an overlap of the story. Also, the story always follows the descendants of the next author. 
And so if you look at a biblical timeline and look at the span of each of the individuals recorded in Genesis, and you look at all the events that take place, and then you compare them to these 11 documents and the lifespan of the author, they are always alive during the events listed in their section or could have talked to someone who was alive during these events. For instance, when you look at the book of the origins of Adam that covers from Genesis 2 verse 4b to Genesis 5 verse 1a, all of these events take place during the lifespan of Adam. In Genesis 11:27, we come to the phrase, this is the origins of Terah. All the verses preceding this statement were written by Terah, and the rest of verse 27, all of the verses afterwards were written by Isaac, as stated in Genesis 25, verse 19. The death of Terah wasn't recorded by himself, it was recorded by Isaac. And this pattern is repeated in every section. Many times we see a much different perspective written from the different authors. And we also see repeated information by different authors. Notice Genesis 6 verse 5. This section was written by Noah and states that the thoughts and actions of man had only become evil continually. Verse 6, it states the Lord regretted that he had made man. Verse 7, the Lord decides to destroy all man and beast. But in verse 8, it states, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah here is saying, I didn't deserve it, but God was merciful to me despite my shortcomings. And then we come to the colophon, which is in the first part of verse 9. This is the origins of Noah. This concludes the account of Noah, and now we begin to see the account of Noah's son. Now immediately we see this change of perspective. The first thing Noah's sons record is kind of a contradiction to what their dad just said. Sure, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but this wasn't for no reason. Our father was a righteous man, perfect in his generations, for Noah walked with God. A righteous and humble man wouldn't say this about himself, but his sons had no problems saying it, and they recorded it. Then they proceed to continue the story of the flood by repeating some of the information that their father Noah had just mentioned earlier. Beginning in verse 11, they state that the earth was corrupt and evil and God had decided to destroy it in a flood. They were repeating the same information given in verse 5, but these were originally written on different documents. Many times these documents do overlap a bit, which we would expect to see. When we watch miniseries or read a book series, they more often than not repeat a little bit of information that was stated previously as a way of reintroducing the story. Textual critics refer to these overlaps as doublets, but we see them in almost every single transition as we would expect to see in these transitions. Genesis 1 verse 1 through Genesis 2 verse 4a, this is the first document and gives the account of the creation. As we begin document 2, beginning in the day that the Lord had made the heavens and the earth, written by Adam, he immediately gives his account of the creation overlaps a little bit with document one, but he also gives more intimate details of the conversations and instructions of God that were given to him. These transitions between documents now become very clear. Adam's document stretches from Genesis 2-4b to Genesis 5-2a, covering the time period from 3973 to 3043 BC. And when you look at all the events of his account, such as the story of Cain, Abel, the descendants of Cain, the occupation of Jubal and Tubal-Cain. He gives quotes by Lamech. All of these events, according to the biblical genealogies, take place during the lifetime of Adam, with the exception of a few events that took place before he was born. Information that could have all been easily relayed to him by the Creator. He then ends his document, once again with the colophon, this is the book of the generations of Adam. We immediately now come to Noah's document, where once again we see an overlap of information. Here we have information that took place before he was born, but could have been relayed to him by someone else, like Eve. In the verse 5, we see a record of Adam's death, as Adam obviously would not record his own. As we come to the genealogy list, the following verses that we see, all these events take place before Noah passed the baton to his sons, recording the events of the flood. It is logical to assume that he wanted to ensure the preservation of this process by instructing all three of his sons to this task, or 
in case he or one of his sons had died prematurely. He ends his document with the standard colophon, as mentioned earlier in Genesis 6, verse 9. Noah does not record his own death, but his sons do in chapter 9, verse 25. Then we come to the fifth document, the origins or histories of Shem, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1b. We see no overlap or introduction like in the other documents, which makes sense considering Shem was a contributor and author of the previous document, number four. He goes right into all the genealogies that took place during his lifetime. This genealogy follows the descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their descendants all the way down to Peleg. It also records the building of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the languages. All of these events took place during the lifetime of Shem. He ends his account once again with the standard colophon in chapter 11, verse 10. These are the origins, or in the Septuagint, it would be the genesis of Shem. As we come to the sixth document, written by Terah, once again we see the same patterns in all the other transitions. Shem's document number five doesn't record his own death, but the next document of Terah does. We see an overlap of the stories as before. The genealogy of Shem ended with the birth of Peleg, but Terah's genealogy goes all the way back to Arphaxad and then ignores the lineage of Shem's brothers and only follows the genealogy of his ancestors, which makes sense. This genealogy continues all the way from Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. All of these events took place before the death of Terah, where he is either a witness to these events himself or could have spoken to someone who did. Terah's short document ends with the standard colophon in the first half of verse 27. This is the account of Terah. The next cuneiform tablets are written by Isaac and Ishmael and begin in the second half of verse 27. Once again, we see all the same patterns as before. We see an overlap of the story. The brothers Isaac and Ishmael refer to in 27, which was just repeated in verse 26, that Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This repetition seems really odd to us, but originally we got to realize that these were written on separate tablets, separate documents, probably written 50 to 100 years apart. Once again, as before, Terah does not record his own death, but these brothers do in verse 32. Now, although much of the account of Isaac's document takes place before he was born, it only stands the reason that his father Abraham was a critical source of information for these events. They record the death and age of their father Abraham in chapters 25 and verses 7 and 8. Isaac's document ends in verse 19 with the standard colophon, these were the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Immediately we come to a new set of documents by Jacob and Esau. We see the exact same patterns in all the other transitions. We see an overlap and repetition of the genealogy going back to the fact that Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac does not record his own death, but Jacob does in Genesis 35, 28. As with Isaac's document, the beginning of the document takes place before the birth of Jacob, but could have easily been relayed to him by his father Isaac. Jacob's document ends as all the others do before his death in Genesis 37, 2 with the standard colophon. This is the Toledah or the Genesis or the histories or the account of Jacob. These documents no doubt had been preserved and protected by the Hebrews during their time in Egypt and then given to Moses. Moses compiled, translated, edited these documents from cuneiform to Hebrew and then continued the story beginning in Exodus. The fact that all of these documents were written in very close proximity to the time period in which they took place explains the high level of historical accuracy from which we see the book of Genesis. One of the claims of the proponents of the documentary hypothesis is that the first five books of the Bible were highly edited at a much later date. Well, as stated earlier, traditional Christian theologians have never denied this, and the Bible has never hid this. The prophets of God, under his direction, had the authority to add to Scripture, edit the text for clarification, update terminology, place names, uh, chronologies, to keep them current. Judges chapter 8 verse 30 refers to the sons of Jonathan being priests in Dan up to the time of the Babylonian captivity, an 800-year span. 
all of this chronology obviously hadn't been written at the time of the judges, but had been updated over time. Genesis 36 records all the descendants of Esau and the chiefs and later kings of the Edomites all the way down to the time of King Saul, an 850 year span. Obviously this chronology had been maintained and updated as well. Genesis 14:14 14, 14 describes that Abraham pursued the four kings with Shalamander all the way to the territory of Dan. Dan hadn't been born yet and his territory hadn't been divided up until 500 years later. Obviously, the original name of this place had been updated. Genesis 2 verse 13 gives a description of the Gijon and Tigris rivers. These updated descriptions and names probably weren't contemporary to the time of creation, but at the time of Moses. Deuteronomy 34 verse 6 states that no man knows the location of the grave of Moses to this day. Well, the day they're referring to is not the same day he died, obviously. This was updated and written by someone else. Also, immediately after his death, in verse 10, it states that there has not been a prophet like Moses since then in Israel. This observation is not referring to in the last 15 minutes since Moses died. This statement had always been attributed to Ezra, who at the final canonization of the Tanakh is making it clear we are still waiting for the arrival of that prophet. It is very clear from these and multiple other passages that the Hebrew scriptures have never hidden the fact that they could be updated and edited over time to keep them current. The holy prophets under the direction of God had the authority to make these edits to scripture. A great example of one of these edits is in 1 Samuel 8 verse 5. Here the elders of Israel demand to Samuel that they receive a king to judge us like all the other nations. In verse 7 and 9, the Lord said to Samuel, They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. Now hearken to their voice, only you shall surely protest solemnly to them and show them the kind of king that should reign over them. So clearly this was not Samuel or Yahweh's idea, even though they were willing to go along with it. In the following verses, Samuel recites all the curses that will accompany a king and finishes by stating, the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey his voice, and they said, no, we will have a king over us. Notice that the people refused to listen to Samuel. This wasn't Samuel or Yahweh's decision, because in reality, they were rejecting the rulership of God. So in 1 Samuel 10, 25, we have an account of Samuel making addition to the Pentateuch. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. There is no place in 1st or 2nd Samuel that explains the behavior of royalty. That passage is actually located in the Pentateuch, one of Moses' book in Deuteronomy 17. It begins by stating in verse 14, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it, and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Well, this scenario is exactly what happened in 1 Samuel verse 8. If this was an option all the time for the leaders to any time ask for a king, they would have quoted it, and no one would have felt rejected. This obviously is not the case. Deuteronomy chapter 4. 17, 14 through 20 was an addition added by Samuel and then was added to the canon of Scripture by God's instruction through the process when he laid it up before the Lord. There are numerous additions like this in Scripture made by the prophets. Over in Numbers 12 verse 3, we have a parenthetical clarification made about Moses. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the men on the face of the earth. Ezra added this clarification to show just how out of line Aaron and Miriam's complaints were considering how meek of a man Moses was. If Moses was some kind of a raging jerk face, we would expect him to get some complaints. The point here made by Ezra was that in fact he was very humble and that's why God hammered Miriam so hard with leprosy. This was a clarification made by Ezra. Now, I've heard atheist theologians. Now, why atheists are teaching theology in the first place is a whole other question, but th they do. But I've heard these atheist theologians quote this passage in class as proof of how shallow and ridiculous the Bible is, and that Moses here is bragging about being humble. 
as though Christians and Jews are really that stupid. Uh, you know, this is just one of numerous editorial clarifications and updates that had been made. Keep in mind the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was canonized over a period of a thousand years. To think that names, places, genealogies didn't need to be updated or the stories didn't need to be clarified after a thousand years is pretty ridiculous. The holy prophets of God had the authority to add to the canon of Scripture, edit it, update it, as directed by God. There's no fraud going on here, okay? As mentioned earlier, the documentary hypothesis, also known as the JEPD theory, referring to the Jehovahists, the Aloists, the priestly sources, and the Deuteronomists. And the, the way that the proponents of DH divide up the Pentateuch is through their use of divine names as though each of these four sources or political religious groups would only record their account using their preferred name for God. Well, this rationale is a it's a logical fallacy. It's the logical fallacy of explained ignorance. They're basically stating because they see no good reason for God to use different names and titles to describe himself, then there is no good reason for him using different names and titles, and therefore it must have been for theological and political reasons. I'll admit understanding why God uses different titles and names to describe himself is not an easy question to ask. Throughout the Tanakh, the scripture uses multiple names to describe God, such as Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai, El Shaddai, uh, Atik Yom. The, the, the list goes on. There are literally dozens of names used to describe God. It's a lifelong journey to understand why God reveals himself to different people in different ways. It's a journey that I'm still on. But I can tell you who's going to be the last person to understand, and that's a bunch of atheists that teach the Bible's a fraud. And for them to state, because we can't figure out why there's any good reason for using multiple names, then the Torah must be a fraud. Well, uh, we should expect that kind of nonsense from them. We should assume they have about the same amount of spiritual insight as a Cocker Spaniel. This shouldn't be shocking to us. And so what exactly is the motivation to push such an outdated and convoluted theory? These critical scholars of DH point out that there were multiple authors to the Pentateuch. Well, I don't disagree with that at all. Moses used at least 11 documents with 13 authors to compile Genesis alone. D.H. shows that there are quite a few doublets where the story is repeated over time. I don't disagree with that or have a problem with that either. Between almost every single document, except for maybe one, the documents overlap a little bit. Don't have a problem. D.H. believes that the Pentateuch was highly edited. I don't disagree with that either. The internal evidence in the Bible shows that multiple prophets of God edited the Pentateuch as they saw fit, which they had the authority to do under the direction of God. D.H. points out that there are multiple different names used to represent God throughout the scripture. Makes perfect sense to me. God has different relationships with different people and uses different names to represent himself. The problem is that even though traditional Christian and Jewish theologians have always acknowledged all of these observations for thousands of years and have had a logical explanation for them for thousands of years, these critical scholars try to pretend that we're completely unaware of any of them, and now that you bring it up, we're just dumbfounded and we don't know what to say. Well, well it's a lie. For them to propose that the only explanation to these anomalies is that the Pentateuch was written a thousand years after the fact is a lie. For them to state that the Hebrews were illiterate until the 10th century BC is a lie. For them to state that the Pentateuch is highly historically inaccurate is a lie. It's all based on lies. One very dishonest tactic that has recently come to light that is used to suppress truth is to control the dialogue. See, it doesn't matter how simple and logical and well-founded the truth is and how highly convoluted and confusing the lie is. If you control the dialogue, if there's only one mic in the room and it's in your hand and you're the only one that has access to it, uh, you can come up with pretty much any kind of bizarre explanation you want to. No one can refute it because no one has the ability to refute it. Is this the first time you've heard this explanation for the formation of the Torah? Well, it isn't because this information hasn't been out there. It's because it's been buried and withheld from you purposely. 
No critical scholar would dare debate the documentary hypothesis because that would imply it's a very debatable hypothesis. Instead, these atheists simply retreat to their echo chamber of academia where they can all praise one another and tell each other one how scholarly they are, pat each other on the back. Well, it's all a smokescreen and it's all a lie. I encourage all of you to read the Torah, the Law of Moses, again for the first time. Read it for its historical accuracy. Read God's Law for the incredible wisdom in it. Read Genesis in light of each author, of how Adam had to own up to all of his stupid mistakes and excuses in the Garden of Eden and record it down for all of us to see. Of how Abraham relayed to his son Isaac accurately the good, the bad, and the ugly of his past actions of how Moses recorded his own triumphs and failures. We see how Jacob began as kind of a shifty opportunist and later grew in grace and knowledge as we all should. We read of the faithfulness of Abraham and the specific blessings promised to him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sand upon the seashores. We read of the prophecies of Jacob of what would befall his descendants, each of his sons, in the last days. We read of how Joseph feared God and even in a foreign land, in slavery, would not sleep with Potiphar's wife because he would not sin against God. Because God was real to Joseph. And these stories should be real to us because God has faithfully and accurately preserved them for our admonition. Read God's law, statutes, and precepts for the incredible wisdom and insight it gives us into the mind of Yahweh. That in Psalms it states it makes us wiser than the ancients. Meditate on these laws. Learn how to apply it in your daily life, and it will be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Every Shabbat in almost every Hebrews congregation, we review a weekly Torah portion where through the course of the year, we read the entire Torah, we discuss it, we midrash it a little, we, we pick it apart a bit, and in the process, we find some amazing truths that God has recorded for us. And as we read the Torah, we can rest assured that God has faithfully preserved His Word by His holy prophets. Thank you.